hello and welcome to our webinar about a recipe for customer centricity in the cookie-less world. Before we get rolling, um, I have one favor to ask. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a link to Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, uh, please uh, just click on Q&A and Palin and I will do our best to answer all of your questions real time. And if we can get to them, uh, we'll make sure to address them at the end of this webinar. And Palin, it's so great to have you here. Thank you for, for joining me. You are right now at EXL in a leadership role, in a data leadership role. And uh, just before EXL, you were at Gerber Life Insurance Company as their VP of Innovation and Analytics. Welcome. Thank you, Greg. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here hosting the webinar with you. I look forward to the next hour with, the, with you and the audience, and hopefully we will have some fun. Absolutely. And my name is Greg Sobik. I am Delft's CEO and founder, and Delft is a trusted advisor to marketing leaders. So Palin, uh, in the spirit of starting, I want to share a screen and I love your smile. You look amazing. Can you, can you tell us what we're looking at? So when did this happen? What are you holding in your hands? Who are the people around you? That was the night when uh, Gerber Life and myself won the At Exchangers 2021 Best First Party Data Strategy by Marketer Award. It was last October, and we did it together with Gerber Life and Dell with your team. And it was a lot of work, a lot of hard work, a long journey, but we finally got there and we were so proud of ourselves. You guys did an excellent job and so did the Gerber Life team. Thank you, you're always, as always, you're being very kind. Now, you know that I couldn't be there. I really wanted to be there. I was, I was at home, we had a bit of a family emergency. So my, my team attended. So I'm kind of imagining that there was a, a big hall or there were many tables. Probably there were many other companies that were competing for this and other awards. And I'm just kind of imagining seeing you, you're sitting at a table and you're hearing that you and Gerber Life and the team got the prize for the best first part data project. What are you feeling in that moment? Honestly, I was standing at the back of the hall because I, it was one of the last awards to be um, announced. And my first reaction is like, holy shit, we actually won. <laughs> it was an incredible feeling where it was so much emotions all rushing through together. And I believe that my team, uh, the team at Gerber Life felt the same way. And so did your team I was like, oh my God, we did it. We finally did it. It's being recognized by the industry, not only by the insurance industry, but also by the digital marketing industry. It felt really, really fantastic. And what I think is very interesting, Palin, is that um, I almost feel like sometimes the universe is trying to tell us something. And obviously, this, this award was for a best first party data project of 2021. And later in the presentation, in this webinar, we are going to talk about the role of first party data uh, as the kind of source of, of customer centricity and third party cookie deprecation as a solution to those problems. Now, I know that the specific data lake project was quite complex. I imagine that it was not inexpensive. I imagine that it was uh, difficult to pitch and yet you made it happen and the team made it happen. Did this feel like a cherry on the top of, of the kind of the cake that was your experience? at Gerber Life, uh, was this a crowning achievement of some sort? Absolutely, but I want to make sure that people know that it's never just one person's success. It's always a team success. Even though I'm here with you today, there is a whole big team that's behind me at that time and they work relentlessly. These are fantastic, intelligent, smart people, the visionaries of the industry, people who are willing to change. 
So th- I know we're going to talk about it. It's about transformation. It's about people. It's about technology. It's about data. So it was incredible, and it is cherry on top. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I want to make a quick, do a quick segue. Um, and this screen has several things going on, but I want to be very true and consistent with the topic of our webinar today. We promised you that we'll discuss with you a recipe for customer centricity in a cookie-less world. And I really want to just use regular words to describe well, what's really cookie-less and what's really customer centricity. And I think that this image does communicate that. So on the left, what we're seeing is that Consumers obviously are expecting a frictionless experience. You know, they, they want the same experience uh, that they are experiencing with Uber or Netflix or Amazon. They want to see that when they work with Gerberlife or a retailer or a non-for-profit. They want it to be frictionless and they want it to be assistive. At the same time, consumers expect something in return when they share their data. And on the right-hand side, we're seeing the industry. It's obviously changing. Privacy is pushing our industry to increase the walled gardens. They're only getting bigger. Obviously, third-party data is going away as a result of that. And the technology landscape is changing. And these two forces, what they're really doing, like pincers, they're squeezing the brands. They're squeezing Gerber Live. They're squeezing all of us on this phone call. And what can we do as a, react, as a reaction to these kind of pressures? Well, many brands choose to focus on their first party data. Again, it's no coincidence that we're using Gerber Life Insurance and their first party data project as an example of how a brand and how you, in your roles today, can react to those two forces. Now, here's the good news, and I think this is very important. I've been doing data, I've been doing technology for the last 22 years, and I'm very clear but this is not about data or technology, ultimately. It's really about driving business results. All of us, all of you are under pressure. You're in the hot seat to deliver results. You have a marketing plan to deliver. Data is a mean to delivering the results that you promised in that marketing plan. So a big thing for today will be not just be first party data, but also the value that first party data generates. And often that's faster growth, that's increasing on return on investment, that's quicker insights. Now, Palin, what's your insight about this dynamic? Uh, can you share any examples of, of pressures, whether from the consumers or from the industry that you were feeling when you were at Gerber Life? There are actually multiple. And since Gerber Life or the insurance industry is in a regulated industry, there is also the regulations and legal compliance we need to be concerned about. Makes sense. So I'm going to speak generally from an insurance industry perspective that uh, first party data is really important and there needs to be a lot of transformation, also changes for us to really better use that data that we already have internally. Understand the data by itself, you know, what the data actually means on a customer level, because consumer expectations, like you said, has changed change drastically. Um, everyone out there is looking to have an Amazon-esque or Netflix-esque type of experiences, right? So the insurance industry needs to deliver that. So that's number one. And then to the other side, you're talking about the wall gardens. Yes, that is going to come down the pipe. You know, technology is going to change. Privacy concerns is going to go up. Regulations, compliance will continue to be there. So how do you push those two things together is through really analyzing the first party data. You really have to know your customers really well. Try to get as much intelligence as possible from the first customer, the first party customer data and try to see what you can make of it. And that's where the value will come from because value will deliver the ROI that everyone is looking for and also better consumer experience. Yeah, I will share one personal experience. When I talk to marketing leaders and, and I ask them what keeps you up at night, one of the recurring themes is, you know, how much money should I put into online, offline? And how do I distribute my budgets among different channels? And with third-party cookie deprecation, it simply is really, it's going to be quite hard soon to understand what's my first touch, what's my second touch, what's my last touch. So who's driving the conversion? Who's assisting? Who's closing? 
and third party powers those kinds of insights. Uh, so that disruption is something that marketing leaders, and that's what they're experiencing because these walled gardens are going up, cookies are going away, and now they really are more blind, right? They're less, less informed about what to do with their budgets and, and they're going back to first party data. And my second question, Palin, is around the value. So again, I personally feel like data for the sake of data, like that's great and it's a great intellectual exercise, but it's not about that. I always remind myself that I am here to help this marketing leader be more successful, to give them confidence. And you know, often we're judged every day on the performance that we deliver. What's the return on investment? Am I contributing to the, to the growth of the enterprise? Am I growing faster than my competitors? Any experience from Gerber Life around the value that either this, this data lake project, and I know you can't share too many details, uh, or any other first party data initiatives delivered. So just value from those initiatives. I would say on a holistic industry perspective, not Gerber Life specific, since I'm in my new role, I have the opportunity to look at uh, multiple clients. I would say that in general, using data to drive value could potentially result in somewhere between, depending on the organizational readiness, some, somewhere between five, at least five to 10% of the annual revenue. So it could be very significant. And that's only the start of the project, not in the middle, not at the end. Meaning that if you actually set up your data infrastructure and you start doing the analytics and start picking up the projects that are meaningful, that are, that are ready for your organization to implement, then you could potentially see a very large return on your investment. So you need to look at your organizational readiness to get there. And I love that point because that really is a great segue, thank you, to another, you're making my life easier, that's always great, to, to this slide. And, and let me explain what I mean by this. So um, when we we're planning this webinar, when we were coming up with ideas for different titles. And we just came up with the title of a recipe, right? And as we're then getting close to this webinar, we were thinking of, well, what, what is really a recipe? So we took it at one step further. <laughs> we actually took it all the way down, I would argue. And we said, well, recipe has ingredients. And before I start to make a recipe, I have a cookbook and I'm opening that cookbook and I'm looking through different recipes. And I'll explain, we'll explain in a moment with Palin what all of that means. This is not a, you know, a, a webinar about cooking, right? For sure, you are in the right place. But my point is that if I think about myself and, and I occasionally like to cook, and if I open a cookbook, if I start cooking, I'm always thinking, well, am I, making a breakfast for my wife and our three daughters on Sunday morning? Or am I inviting friends Friday night and I'm, and I'm cooking for a different occasion? And I think it's always very important before we start doing anything, before we start any projects, meaning recipes, that we that solve these problems that we're facing, that we're very clear about the challenge that we're facing, that we're very clear about the objective that we're trying to address. So what I want to do right now, and you know, I've seen this quote for over many years, by the way, which is why we're showing it to you, but let's take several minutes, not 55 minutes, but let's take several minutes. And uh, there should be a poll starting in a moment on your screen. And do me a favor, a question will come up about the kinds of challenges that you're facing and there'll be a second poll as well. So I'm, uh, maybe my team at Delft can launch it right now. And just take a minute, uh, check the answers that, that make sense to you. There are no right or wrong answers. You know, um, it's all about just kind of your best, your best guesses. And again, if you don't see it, you may want to go to polls at the bottom and, uh, and um, that will be, uh, the pop-up should be there. And I'm already seeing all the answers come through and I think we're done. It looks like, well, not surprising, right? Many of you came here to, to, to understand how to deal with third party cookie deprecation. Uh, that's 54%. I'm seeing that 50% enha enhancing personalization across the customer journey. That's very relevant. Great. So thank you. So we actually have a second follow-up poll and I'll explain in a second why those exist. So I'm going to ask my team to launch poll number two, 
and we're going to save poll number one, so we remember the results, poll number two should be now visible on your screen. Here's the thing. The first poll was about, was about big disruptions. So big topics like third, third party data, you know, customer journey, personalization. This one is about evergreen challenges. Now explain in a moment why they're related. As you're filling out this poll, I would argue, again, I've been in doing this for 22 years, that these evergreen challenges, when I was at Bath and Body Works, managing media, managing marketing in a director of marketing role, when I was working for a variety of startups, when I've been here at Dell for 11 years, I've seen these recurring cha challenges come up again and again. So I'm looking at the results. Thank you. Collecting high fidelity first party data, using insights in marketing. And I think attribution is the third one. So let's close the poll. Thank you all for your for participation. And I'm going to wait a moment. And we're going to paste these polls into the actual presentation. And I mean, Palin, as we're waiting for these polls to be presented, and actually, oh, I am being told that we have the results. <laughs> so let me share the results with all of you because I, you know, it's hard to remember. So again, uh, Palin, I'm going to ask you to interpret this. But I just want to remind everyone the reason why we are asking you about these big disruptions is because sometimes we use, we use big words, you know, we use complicated concepts to describe these big disruptions, and they're a little ambiguous. On the other hand, when we think about evergreen challenges, and I would again argue, based on my experience, that I've seen these challenges 10 years ago, I see them today. And I think they will be happy that we'll be dealing with them. I don't think we'll ever stop. I think these challenges on the right hand side will always be with us. This process will never stop. And I think they're interconnected, and we'll explain to you in a moment how they're interconnected. And they are, and they're all can be solved by, by a number of recipes. But Palin, um, I'm just wondering when you were at Gerber Life, when you are talking with marketing leaders today at EXL. Are you hearing these challenges come up? Is, is this sort of surprising you or does this look familiar? This is very consistent across the industry. And if you look at all these poll results and the answers, most of these are first party data problems. We may say that we are going to be cookie less now and in the future, but the truth is we have always needed to focus on first party data. It's about the connection of the data, it's about the insights that we can find once we've connected the data, it's about how powerful one is going to be with that data, right? So let's talk about how we can get there. Yeah, and I mean, my, my interpretation, I'm just looking at this right now, is that on the one hand, if I look at the left-hand side, we all want to be pre prepared for third-party cookie deprecation. And that could be, by the way, a webinar of its own. Now, on the other hand, I'm looking at the right-hand side and I'm seeing that there is a huge need for data-driven insights in digital marketing, or 48% of you said collecting data that, that is high fidelity is, is important to you. These are frankly very foundational challenges. So we have these very foundational challenges on the, on the right-hand side. They're about measurement. And on the left-hand side, we have these very strategic challenges. And it's very easy to be, you know, it's very easy to, to kind of um, to not be certain, right, how to, how to attack this. So what I want to share, and Palin, I would love your feedback, is this following screen. Now, again, we'll not go into this, and I know there's lots going on. But the one thing I would love for you to walk away with is that the items on the left are a variety of recent disruptions like first party data and evergreen challenges. And I am not saying that this is a complete list. You may be experiencing very unique challenges and very unique disruptions that are specific to your, the size of your brand, the growth of your brand, the industry of your brand, your role as a marketing leader in that brand. But there will always be a number of challenges or objectives that you want to accomplish on the, right hand, on the left hand side. 
And one way to organize and systemize these objectives into a number of like easy to digest solutions or approaches, recipes, and we'll talk about it in a second, is to categorize them into four buckets. One bucket is data, activation, technology, and people. I know this doesn't look new. And I know you probably have seen this before, but when you think about data as the process of understanding governance, how to collect data, how to generate insights, as a reminder, data collection and insights was one of those green evergreen challenges that, that you said that were most important to you. Activation is just really digital marketing, activating data, using data in marketing. And that's about what doesn't work, efficiency, what works, effectiveness. How do I manage the processes? How do I think about attribution? Technology is about planning your technology. Like, do you have the right technology? Is it properly configured? It's about in-housing technology and then the, your in-housing agency uh, partners. So the moment that we can look at this landscape from these four buckets, in terms of these four buckets, we can start to systemize things. We can start to design different recipes. And, and Palin, and what are you hearing? What are you seeing here? A any feedback that you can share with us? I was just going to say that, Greg, I think you're being very humble. What you have put together there, anybody can use that as a starting point, as a roadmap of what to do to reach that best first party data strategy, you know, using the roadmap you just lay out and put in additional projects as appropriate for the organization. So you can add in different perspectives and you can also kind of check off where your organization is ready on different spots. But out of all these columns, I would say that each one of them is very important. Each one of them is equally important. Other than the fact, I think the people portion is probably the most important. And one needs to focus on that first, because without the people column, it's impossible to do the other tech activation and data columns. So Palin, I think that's a very, that's a very important insight. And, and again, and I'm sorry, everyone, you're going to be sick of me by the end of this webinar because this topic of recipe and cookbook and ingredients, it will come up again and again. Uh, but when I think about, again, you know, preparing a, a, a dinner for my family, it is all about the human element, right? I am the one selecting the ingredients. I'm the one putting the recipe together. I am the one cooking the dinner. And same with your team, same with you and your team and your agency and, and vendors. It's really not about data activation and technology. It is about your approach and the approach of your team. And in about 10 minutes, we'll talk about how Palin approached this at Garibu Life. And it was exactly about a people first approach, changing the team. And what I think with Palin, we're going to argue that when we talk about transforming, when we talk about launching new projects, marketing transformation is really about people transformation. But in the spirit of geeking out for two more minutes, I would like to argue that when we look at the top, again, data activation, technology, people, that those are the ingredients. These are the four core ingredients that you absolutely can control right now. You can, do, you can mix these ingredients different, different, many different ways. And inside, inside are just examples of some recipes. So inside, what we're looking at is different recipes, different projects that you can launch to address customer centricity and third party cookies going away and focus on first party data. And I'll give you some examples. And Pelin, I would love your feedback in a second. For example, uh, some of you mentioned, many of you mentioned, again, if I remember that, 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 that survey, that collecting high fidelity data, first party data is important to you and using data. So using this left box in digital marketing activation is important to you. Well, I would argue that's about fundamentals. It's about configuration, for example, of your analytics tools. It's configuration of your media buying tools. For example, are your media campaigns structured the right way? Uh, it's about using reports that tell stories, that tell us what, why something is happening, not just what is happening. I would argue that maybe it's about best practices in using data to drive media decisions. Maybe it's about in the case of Gerber Life and any non-for-profit, any retailer, maybe it's about really rethinking your data and its role in digital marketing, because maybe as a retailer, you should be managing to lifetime value, not cost per order. 
Maybe when you're a Gerber Life or insurance company, you should be managing to cost per closed policy, not cost of acquisition. If you're non for profit, maybe you should be managing to monthly recurring donors, not one time donors. So, what I find very interesting, Palin, is that yes, we are talking today about data lake, and then we'll talk about it in a, in a moment. But there are many, I would almost say, foundational projects or recipes that brands should focus on. And of course, I'm giving away the, the, the kind of story here, but what are you seeing on this slide? I am seeing things that we have done in the past, you know, to gain that efficiency. And there are some questions that I see that um, the audience is asking about what efficiency really means. And I think efficiency needs to be determined by your organization. So for example, from a insurance perspective, it could be cost per converted policy, or it could be lifetime value, or yep. it could be uh, cost per application. It's really depending on the organization on what the organization determines as an efficiency. So there are a lot of examples of digital marketing efficiency. And I think Greg has some of that, you know, specifics in there. So for example, if you do a um, MMM model, so that's like multi, you know, multimedia modeling where you figure out what you should really focus on in order to get the most outcome for the investment that you put into marketing. So that is all an example of efficiency gain in digital marketing. And also in Greg's roadmap here, you see in different spots, you can do those things. You can get the data, you can do the analytics to come up with what is appropriate for your organization. So if your organization cares about displays, outcome, and maybe there will be an efficiency KPI for you to decide whether by modeling more, by doing more analytics, by connecting data would drive to that efficiency allowables. So that's how I think about it. And that's how I think about Greg's um, roadmap here on the screen, because you really need to take that and put it into your own organization's terminology and the success criteria. And, and thanks, Bailey. And I'm also seeing, uh, and thank you, by the way, this is, it's great to get these questions. Um, so kind of my personal perspective on what are examples of efficiency gains in digital marketing from using first party data? What do we mean by efficiency? First efficiency, like I agree, it's just a fancy word. That means identifying what doesn't work. What doesn't work? And I'll tell you, this really speaks to this idea of silver bullets versus bronze bullets. Like I, I know that we all would love to get these silver bullets. There's this, this amazing way, amazing technology, amazing strategy that's going to solve many problems. What I'm finding again and again, and it's very humbling, frankly, is that when we go to basics, and when we think about, for example, efficiency is nothing but this box here that is activation best practices. Meaning when I am managing digital marketing, I am asking my team, I am asking my, my agency, show me how the data that I am collecting about my campaigns, which is first party data, by the way, the data that I own about my campaigns, that's first party data. Show me what doesn't work. If every week, when we're managing media with our internal teams or external partners, if we ask them every week, give me one insight, data-driven insight this week that helps me understand what doesn't work, what delivers a negative ROI or ROI that's not high enough and what we should stop doing. And then help me understand how much money I'm going to save because I stopped wasting my budget if it was 1% saving every week, it's going to add up very quickly, right? And, and if all you do every week, as an example of a simple recipe, because I see the second question, what are some easy recipes? So hard recipe, by the way, is Data Lake, the Data Lake project, we'll talk about it in a second. But if every week your agency partner came to you with one insight about what doesn't work, something that they will stop doing, and how much money it's going to save you, and how you can then reallocate it to things that work. I think something magical is going to happen, but honestly, it's going to be like exercise, right? 
you go to the gym. I, I go, I try to, you know, go to the gym often. God, I, it's hard to see what, what, what's happening really. But I know if I keep on doing it, good things will happen. Palin, any, anything you're feeling or thinking about? I think the easy recipe would be you need to get your, all your analytics ready and you need to read your analytics more on a real-time basis and actually do something about it. It's not just about reporting. See, I did not say reporting, I say analytics. Because every time when you read the data, you need to have an interpretation, you need to have actions. When there are no actions, stop producing the reports. You know, my team would tell you a hundred times that, you know, I never wanted people to spend time on reporting that does not produce actions. So you generate a report, you read it, and you translate that into something your company can do or change, improve upon. I know that we are not using company specific examples, but I can give you one. So for example, if you are looking at your results and for example, if the results look really bad, right? And you're looking at the traffic, you need to understand if the traffic composition has changed or is it on the conversion side? It's as simple as that. And once you realize that's a cause for the change on the performance, what are you going to do about it? And that will be a use case implementation, albeit the minor one. So that will be a very easy day-to-day -day thing that one can do. And I think that Balin really well addresses, and I think that's your responding to this question, which is, is there a company case study that demonstrates best in class of aggregating and activating first party data? And just to restate what you were saying, I don't really, I know that there, there are absolutely best in class ways to do certain things. Every one of the boxes that you're seeing on the screen, and there are many, there are many recipes or projects, they're obviously not, 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 not showing you. That's something that should be done one-on-one. -on -one. All of us have a unique situation. But yes, there is a best in class way to solve some of these problems. But again, what helps me is when I think about it as, yes, it's all about first party data. Everything in the middle here is first party data because it's our own data. Whether it's an impression that we serve, it's a website visit, it's a conversion, it's a data point in a CRM system. It's all our own data, first party. It's our own data. First party data is just a nicer way of, of describing data that I own. But every, each one of us has to figure out a way to organize these projects in a way that's best for us. And again, that's about bronze bullets and crawl walk run versus, you know, there being one perfect way to do it. And Palin? Best in class is what actually works. Okay. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Best in class is actually what works. So that means that don't just listen to us telling you what would actually be working, what our best class, best in class, because it may not apply to your organization. So my recommendation would be just keep on trying. You try and you fail and you win. And from that learning, you will figure out what best in class is for your organization. But you can start with a template that Greg is going to put together for the audience. Well, and, and by the way, we are um, organizing a roundtable next Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern. So uh, if you want to talk about this more, we will be available next Thursday at 12 or separately just you know we can we can do a quick conversation one on one because again there's no one there's no one size fits all everyone has a unique situation everyone has unique challenges and these recipes have to be kind of organized in a way that is the right fit for you uh and this is just a high level framework so to summarize and i just i had to put this slide together again <laughs> back to recipes and ingredients and what we're saying to summarize is that the ingredients are always the same. It's data at the top, it's technology on the right, it's activation of data and technology on the left. And at the foundation are the people, the people who bring these ingredients together. And on the right, there are different recipes. Maybe you need one of them to get started. Maybe you have an issue with web analytics or media tracking, that's data collection. And some of these items at the bottom are the right recipes for you. And maybe you've done all of this. You've checked all the boxes going from the bottom to the top, and you're ready for a data lake project like one that Palin did at Gerber Life. But Palin, I mean, it took you 
three, four years of being in Gerber Life to do the data lake project. I think that's an example of, of what we're talking about, that you've taken care of these foundations. That, does that resonate? Absolutely, because um, I know the audience wants to know a lot more specific, so I can throw something out there. So, for example, you need to know what the lifetime value for your customer is, right? And you need to know in a different way, think about break even to see when you are actually going to break even with your marketing investment on marketing and distribution, right? So that's another one. And you can think about specifically how much you want to invest money on creating the halo, um, top of the funnel marketing. How do you want to spend money there? Because you are not going to see a strong correlation to conversion. If that's the case, do you need attribution? And what kind of attribution do you need? Do you want attribution on the first click, last click, middle click, whatever? You know, these are all things that one can do before you get to the point to say, wow, we need to do a lot more. We need to do organizational transformation projects. And Data Lake, in this case, is more like an organization transformation project because it involves cross-functional teams. It involves a lot more data. So just think about what your organization is ready for and pick out some of these specific things and see what's appropriate for your organization. Test and learn from the results to see if it's actually useful. And I see one quick question, and we'll answer it and we'll get moving because uh, I want to talk about couple of the item, items that Palin, you and I discussed before. There's one question here about, can you still rely on analytics in a world where users are blocking all cookies except essential ones? Here's the quick answer. This goes back to this value exchange. I mean, there's a very technical answer, which is basically, for example, if, if users are using Chrome and your analytics tools and media buying tools are linked to Google, Google Analytics 360 is an example of that natively that's considered first party data, you're actually capturing most data. But there's another argument here, which is first party data, like a first party data strategy also assumes that consumers expect something in return. So if you're giving them a reason to register into your environment, to create an account, to proactively share their data, you will be collecting this data. So, so I think that the shift that we have to go through is that we don't expect consumers to leave their data behind, that we actually proactively encourage them to share it with us. But I want to continue on our, on our journey. And if you remember, and this is to all the participants, if you all remember maybe 20 minutes ago, we said out of the four ingredients, data technology, uh, activation, people are most important. Palin, you made, made it very clear. So let's imagine that we figured out this disruption to ingredient mapping. And we have a bunch of ideas about data collection. Maybe it's about using data to manage media. Maybe we have a, an idea for how to collect explicitly more first party data. I imagine we should just go to our you know, CMO. If I'm the CMO, I'm going to the CEO, I'm pitching it. And they're going to say, voila, yes, I'm all in. Is that what's going to happen, Palin, or, or do you think that- <laughs> That I'm has gonna... never happened to me. It's never voila. I was just, I was just asking. I was just asking. <laughs> That's probably only happens in Greg's world when you go pitch to a client and voila, client just signs up the next day. I, that doesn't happen, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> so the answer is like, there's a lot of work to be done. And specifically, I think um, one needs to build a lot of trust and respect within um, your own organization. You need to spend the time putting the sweat equity to really prove yourself to the others that the analytics that you're producing are actually right and that is predicting the future. And I, I'm loving this webinar because there are some really fantastic, smart questions that's being asked in the chat. And I definitely want to address Jeffrey's question later. Um, so we, we need to think about what is appropriate for your organization again? And you need to build that trust and respect and you need to figure out, you need to figure out who in your organization you need to build that trust and respect with. You need to power map it. You need to understand your organization not based on hierarchy, but based on power of people because you wanna be able to influence people. You wanna be able to convince people. You wanna get your peers and your superiors to become your best friend in a way that they would give you unconditional trust on the analytics that you're gonna come up with, right? And on those analytics, 
you can come up with them because you would have all the data in the back to back up with everything you are saying. And but, Greg, you kind of flinched. Well, because, you know, Palin, why wouldn't they just give you the trust? Why do we have to earn it? I think if you just have the trust, it's actually very scary. I mean, for example, I'm in a new world right now and I feel I walked in and they have all this trust for me, but I don't feel I deserve it yet. I haven't done anything of value, right? I rather I prove myself, I show value with quantitative and experience to deliver business outcome, positive performance, right? And if trust is just given to you, then you go ahead you are not really learning. That's how I see it. So that's just my very humble opinion because I like to work on growing up. So, so I, I like how you said learning. The, the third item here was attitude or desire to change. Why, die, why, why does that matter? Why, why do we have to have the right attitude? Why do we have to be willing to get outside of our comfort zone to make change happen, to actually make, to launch these maybe sometimes basic and sometimes transformative first party data projects. I'm gonna go off tension a little bit and share with the audience um, one of the meetings I had with Greg where he made a, a huge impression on me is he <laughs> walk into one of our meetings um, and he started going up to the board and started saying, this is all the wrong way of doing things. So he started telling us very passionately about what should get done and Truthfully, very few people do that. Very few people would actually put themselves out there, whether it's right or wrong. They don't always put themselves out there and be vulnerable and really be there and show people what you truly believe in and what you are passionate about. And for people to hear that passion, the audience will feel the need to want to follow and change. And the desire to change is so important because without advocates, without evangelists of a certain topic, human nature is to go with the inertia. That's a lot more comfortable. Change is hard because change means that we have to change our mindset. We have to change the way we behave. We probably have to you know, condition ourselves differently and that doesn't come over time. So the desire to change will allow one to learn to see the world differently, to be more open-minded about the passion that's out there versus writing it off because it doesn't fit within my organization, or it does not fit with my CEO's KPI right now. You need to keep that open mind in order to create the change that you need in your organization. Did that and answer look, your question, Greg? Yeah, and look, here, here's how I interpret this, this point. Uh, I think that often when we think about marketing transformation, we are thinking about those silver bullets. And to me, being willing to change or getting outside of our comfort zone is being really about being honest with ourselves and admitting that we have a number of foundational problems, like those that, that our webinar participants identified, data collection, using data in marketing or personalization across customer journey. And of course, personalization is not easy. Data collection, using data in marketing is easier to do. And to me, getting outside of our comfort zone is about admitting that it's all first party data and admitting that we need to crawl before we walk and before we run. And sometimes it's just frankly hard to do because those are the fundamentals that, that we have to get started with. Now, Palin, I'm doing a quick time check. We have five minutes left. And I know knowing you and knowing me, when we've known each other for years, you know, I could be here for another two hours with you but we promised the participants a quick Q&A at the end. So let me quickly talk about this, this period of the slide, which and my question to you is really, is there a best way to launch these projects, right? Should we launch with small proof of concepts or should we go for a big hairy growth zone, you know, transformative solution? I would make it really quick. My personal experience is I'd rather go with the POCs, multiple POCs quickly and do it successfully or fail and learn from it and then go after the Harry project because then you would have like earned the respect and you will also learn a lot in the process. 
However, it's not always true depending on the organization because you could be that next CMO that's walking into the organization that has already done the POCs and you're ready for the big transformation, right? So it depending on who your organization is, but my approach is always POC first, learn because you never know, you may be surprised by your data, it may go against conventional wisdom or legacy understanding of the business. And remember how you told me a while back that it's very important to deliver tangible value to say this proof of concept drove X, Y, Z. And I think you almost mentioned it has to be several million dollars. It has to be you know, noticeable to make impact. Correct. I like to have millions behind anything that I deliver, if possible, and I like to make the POC as, happen as quickly as possible. So pick what is most useful, most valuable for you when you are doing that POC. Great. So I have a quick recommendation. Um, I really love seeing questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any ongoing questions, please continue to add them in the Q&A. And we'll kind of use the next 10 minutes as the Q&A as, as we continue to go through these concepts. Uh, now, uh, we are going to launch a new poll and that's happening in a moment. And we just want to see how many of you feel that you're ready for a uh, kind of evolution. So those are these proof of concepts where you can launch smaller projects and in the process, earn the trust of the organization and prove value and how many of you are ready for revolution so you're ready for the big project like data lake um because the org is ready and i'm seeing the results and what's interesting is that many of you are basically and if my team can post the results the presentation it looks like basically i'm actually surprised 86 percent of you feel that it's about crawl walk run so that and to me bias people right before the poll <laughs> yes yes bias but i mean palin to me this really speaks to this idea of like marketing transformation and coming up with big ideas is maybe about these smaller recipes these smaller projects and proving to our organization that something that may that i called an evergreen challenge like data collection using data to improve performance i think attribution was something that, that many participants mentioned that these are actually first party data projects that deliver tangible value and that then those projects earn, earn us the right to launch projects like your data lake what are you hearing sorry I was reading the questions. Sure. <laughs> I'm so excited by all the questions there. So sorry, repeat that. No, so, so my question was, uh, it seems to me that in order to launch a project like your data lake, and let's get into do it right now, we really may want to focus on these smaller, you know, more maybe uh, a big project, right? So projects that are kind of easier to wrap our arms around, like cleaning our data, doing attribution, using data in media management. And once we do those smaller projects, then we can earn the right to pitch a big project. I would definitely do that. And if you're a marketing person, um, I think Greg, you and I talked about this, a CMO's tenure is usually two to three years. That's the opportunity they have. Exactly. So use your first year to do a lot of this ground level work, cleaning up the data, you know, getting some attribution done and do more analysis about your lifetime value or about your audience segmentation, clustering them, all different kinds of uh, statistical modeling techniques that you can use. And from there, you will learn a lot. And so hopefully by the middle of the second year, you can launch the Harry project. And any of these Harry project, depending on how much resources you put behind it and the type of people you have, you could probably do them within six months or less, right? So if you do that, you will still have the third year to really realizing the results and to really receiving the benefits on a big Harry project that you have launched. So, so let's talk about this big Harry project, right? So again, this was the project that you received the award for best first party data project of 2021 by Ad Exchanger. First, what is a data lake? 
it's really not that special. Data lake is a place uh, for data storage in the cloud. <laughs> We're just calling it data lake. It's for structure on structured data. And why does, but it work, we, but we are calling it data lake, not a data warehouse. Uh, is unstructured data impo an important differentiator and, and why between a warehouse and a lake? I think it, it is important because ultimately to service the customers well, you want to know everything about these customers. And I hope that uh, your organization is tracking all the data, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to connect them all, all at the moment before you start doing something. Just continue to put data in. Right, you can put your social sentiment data. You can put uh, the contact center data. You know the transcript. These are you know these are less structured than the specific. If you have an order, you have a name, you have you know products purchase and how much money they spent. That's a lot more structured, right? So you can put in the the data that's easy to put in. Connect as much as possible and try to see what you have and how much you can actually analyze. And I'm always a fan of getting additional data. There's a lot of data out there that's public, okay? And there's also data that you can, census, census level data, or even specifically more financial data, depending on who you work with, as third party data append to your first party data. I mean, based on my, my, based on my experience, I, I think of a data lake as a environment that's also marketing driven where marketing defines its objectives. And of course, you always have to work closely with IT, but marketing is driving the initiative. And there's always clarity about the kinds of questions that have to be answered. And the ability to answer those questions well with a data lake is what defines success. So it's really about a, an objective-driven project, technology project versus you know, a, a tech-driven project. Now, why did Gerber Life decide to even do this data lake project? What were some, some of the drivers behind these initiatives? It's very it simple. Be? It's very simple because Gerber Life wanted to be better, wanted to be faster, and also wants to spend less on infrastructure. So who can beat better, better faster, and cheaper, right? And data lake, the transformation of the infrastructure, the data technology, and as well as analytic capability, really help Gerber Live and any organization to really advance their performance. And I'm a data gal at heart. I'm a data geek. Do it, guys. Don't wait. So, you know, that, that, that again, that's interesting. Back to marketing transformation doesn't have to be about something that's terribly complex from, from a concept perspective. Like, this was obviously a very complex um, project. Now, uh, the value, and we spoke about value, value earlier and how it's important for value. The value in this case was, for example, saving X uh, in data processing costs, right? So it's not, it's not the value isn't just I'm making money, it's also I'm saving money. And in this case, there were clear cost savings. There were other benefits as well that, I, that I'm aware of, but that is value. Now, my, my, my one final question, and we'll move on, was we are talking about the recipe for cookie, cook customer centricity in a cookie-less world. We are saying that first priority data is the answer to these problems. Can you just talk to us about uh, how this project helped Gerber Life address the fact that third party data is disappearing? Was there, was there a focus on first party data? Is disappearance of third party data really the reaction's first party data? How, how was this project? helping your life with first party data collection. I know it's a very obvious point, but I, I would love for you to restate it. It's a natural progression. I, maybe you and I are coming from a different perspective, but it's a natural progression for any organization. If you want a good at what you do, meaning know your customers, know the data, know your customer's data, and to be able to interpret it accurately to be able to forecast what the performance will be and what is influencing the performance, you must do first party data. So it doesn't matter whether cookie is disappearing or not, you have to invest in first party because that's the only way you can actually cross out upsell and also forecasting using similar information and insights to find prospects in the future. 
And very quickly, Faith, I'm just seeing a question about uh, putting the answers, the polls into perspective. So uh, we had 30 people participate. So as an example, uh, the last question, poll three was about evolution versus revolution. 86% or basically 25 people said that they prefer Kral or Kran. And then the revolution was five individuals. So this is, it sounds like 30 people have participated in the poll. So I'm just doing this for the, for the, for the benefit of the question. And then we're starting to quickly wrap up and panel again. I, I, I love talking to you. <laughs> I wish we did this for hour and a half, not just 60 minutes, which flew by very quickly. Um, I would love to start closing with this slide again. I, we talk about marketing transformation, right? We talk about the fact that uh, these kinds of projects, uh, they can be about revolution. They can also be about crawl, walk around. I have to imagine that from a personal perspective, being at Gerber Life for over five years did transform you in many ways. Can you just talk to us about how has your belief system changed? Like who, if I met you, which I have, but five years ago when we met and right now, how has your belief system changed? Maybe in the context of pushing yourself or getting outside of your comfort zone. I had no idea how to lead a digital transformation project as big as the one that just won the award. I had no, I had no idea, guys. The truth is that I was a marketing person. I did analytics. I love, I love numbers. And then I realized, oh my God, there's so much here. There's such great opportunity. So how am I going to do that? I went back to school. So during pandemic, I actually went back to school and I learned from my lovely Brown University about how to lead transformation as a technology leader and what I need to focus on. And that felt very differently because he gave me the confidence of standing behind my beliefs and saying the things that I found in the data and to stand out there in probably not a gender equal world to speak up and advocate for what I believe in is right. And as a result, I grew a lot as a professional. And that also led to my reevaluation of my life, of what I need to do and what would make me happy. And that consequently actually led me to a different job because I had different set of skills I would like to develop. So I wanna share that story because I think for every organization transformation, there will be personal transformation that goes along with it. Without learning, no organization will transform. So that's the answer to some questions. I love it. And, and we're going to close out in the next you know, minute. Here's a quick recipe. I won't go through it. Um, but I would like to invite you, if you're, you know, I see a question here about algorithmic buying versus manual lever pulling. I think about this as human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. And if you're interested, you can go to uh, this website. We're going to share this uh, after the webinar and we will be available next Thursday, the 17th at, at, at noon. And it's going to be a round table format. Anyone can come and join. We're going to address live. Uh, these are not any other questions. We can get deeper into your specific business and we can provide some quick solutions or some quick recipes for you to consider that are relevant to your situation. And Palin, uh, I just really want to thank you. You're amazing. You know that you're my hero. I hope we'll stay in touch forever. And I'm so excited about your new role at the Excel. And I'm just really grateful that you, uh, you know, made yourself available today. Okay, Greg, I'm going to do the emotional thing, but I want to answer Jeffrey's question because oh, I, I, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. So, Jeffrey, your question I'm about good. internal, external com competition. Okay, start collecting the data because all that can be modeled. And I will tell you from my experience, you can actually figure out the, the percentage influence between external data and internal data and how much you will influence your business. And from there, you can model like different parts to really predict the future. I hope that's enough for you to get started. And now, Greg, it's such a pleasure to be here to talk to your audience. We go back a long way, and certainly this relationship has to continue whether we work together or not. It's such an honor to talk to the audience today and to be 
your co-host. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you and have a great everyone. Have a great uh, Tuesday. And uh, again, if you are interested in continuing the conversation, I'll see you next Thursday at uh, 12 Eastern. Have a great day. Thank you.